Hello, everyone. Welcome to 101. This is Meredith Beach and my partner, Kate Forsatz. And we are here today with Emily Chalmers. Hi, guys. I'm Emily, and I'm a costume designer. I work in New York mostly, but I have worked in other places as well. I'm originally from the UK. I don't know if that's fairly obvious. <laughs> but yeah, no, I've been working in film and television for the last 10 years uh, in the US. What do you do? You said you're a costume designer and, you know, that does seem a little bit like, oh, I know what that means. But how would you define your role? So for me, costume design is about creating a three dimensional character using what we all think every day is so easy and basic. Right. You go into your closet, you pick out your clothes. Thought is gone into it, but it. It's what makes you you, it's your mark, it's your character. It's the first thing somebody sees before you open your mouth. It's the first thing they make a judgment on. And so um, it's that visual representation. And so for me, costume design is about that. It's about creating those characters, fleshing them out, giving them a reality. So that basically is what I think of costume design. Um, uh, yeah, it's basically storytelling through the character. It could be, you know, modern day, something we all know, or it could be fantasy, um, or it could be outer space or something like that, you know, it could be uniforms, whatever it is, you know, um, we all don't maybe think about it, but it is the first thing you make a judgment on when you see somebody is how they look and how they appear. So um, that's part of the storytelling of the characters, I think. What does your team look like? Sure. I mean, obviously, it does vary from budget to budget. And uh, the dream team would be obviously the costume designer. Um, and then you would have a, an assistant costume designer underneath you, an ACD. You might have more than one of those if you're very, very lucky. Um, and then uh, there would be another sort of section, which is the shoppers. And um, they're also creatively thinking. So they will go out for you and source all the things that you want um, and a good shopper will bring you things that you haven't even thought of too and then there's a coordinator and uh, he or she kind of coordinates exactly what it sounds like they coordinate um, the, the department um, the uh, shop it, shopping that comes in and out they make sure that reaches its right destination um, scheduling that kind of thing for, for the design team um, just kind of keeping the shop running, basically. Then you have um, your wardrobe team, um, and that's a different set of people. Heading up that department would be your wardrobe supervisor, and they're responsible for getting your vision from the shop to the set basically. They're responsible for helping you with script breakdown and knowing what scenes are shot when, uh, whether or not we repeat days or not, because that's very important, uh, whether or not there needs to be multiples of a thing. And then they uh, run basically the day-to-day -day of set and underneath them would be a tailor. So anything that we might need uh, altering, or altering or creating from scratch. So you might even have a whole team of tailors and depending on the project, you know, you might have specialty people who can just deal with armor or just deal with leather or something like that, you know, so it depends on the kind of project you're on. And then there are your um, set costumers, basically, and they are your eyes and ears on set. And it's their job to kind of keep track of all the different costumes that they use. And uh, am I missing anybody else out? There's a lot of people in our department. <laughs> um, and then there are PAs, and that's really an important role. Like, I don't want to not stress how important PAs are for our department. I mean, they are for the whole thing, but they do everything else that you could imagine, really. And uh, you might also bring in a team of fitters, just very specifically for fitting people. Yeah, this is a lot of people. <laughs> I have a question. How do you? know where to source it really depends uh, on the project and the budget and um, so if you've got a higher budget you can go higher end specialty places mm -hmm. designer if you've got a lower budget you have to stick to high street unfortunately or thrift shopping is actually a massive part you know but having said that high-end movies also thrift shop because you never know yeah. what you're gonna get there i remember i helped you out on three bound right 
yeah I was a, a shopper in Brooklyn for a few days. You were. That was really fun. Yeah, exactly. Well, um, that was such a great overview. So I want to kind of backtrack a little bit. And like, how did you know that this is what you wanted to do? What was the moment where you were like, this is it? Yeah, it was a journey. And that's what I really like about our industry, generally speaking, is that nobody actually has the same path. When you talk to somebody about how they got from A to B, everybody has a different story. And that is great because it means there isn't a set way to get from there. You can find your own way. So I started off um, doing theatre in the UK and I honestly thought I was going to be an actress and sort of entered into my degree um, thinking that way. And then after the first year, um, I kind of found, I found the art side of everything. I, I previously had um, art training, fine art training. Um, and I sort of was at a crossroads. Do I continue acting or do I go down my art sort of roots? And I guess the art roots won out. <laughs> I'll never know what happened if I'd gone the other way, but um, it just where I felt more comfortable. And I started off in theater and I actually started off doing scenic design and lighting design for theater in the UK. During my uh, undergrad degree in the UK, I did a year abroad in the US. And one of my uh, teachers there was a costume designer and she did costume design. And I didn't know that that existed. I had no idea. In theater in the UK, it's very different. We call them a scenographer and they basically do everything that's visual. They do the lighting, they do the scenery, they do the costumes. It's mostly scenery heavy. So that's what you kind of train in. And then the other things kind of are an afterthought, which is really a shame to say, but I will say that's changed more recently in the UK. And I'm glad to see there are more costume design courses popping up all over the place. But in the US that already existed. And I sort of thought, oh my God, this is perfect because I do like what I like about acting is, is embodying that character and creating that character. And costume design lets me do that, but not actually have to be in their shoes physically. <laughs> I can choose their shoes. <laughs> And that's much more interesting to me um, than becoming that character, just the way my, my brain works. So uh, I discovered that and then I decided to pursue it further and I came to the US for an MFA. I went to Carnegie Mellon University and I got my MFA in costume design and it was amazing. I loved it. It's everything that I wanted it to be. Switched from theatre to film when I moved to New York and um, I haven't really looked back. It's so interesting that you started as an actor and then you had this shift. And, you know, having worked with you, it makes so much more sense to me now because you have this intuition. When I handed you the script for Three Bound, you put together these sketches that I'm like, oh my gosh, like you know these people. <laughs> and to know that you have just so many different facets to who you are as an artist. I think so, so many people think that you have to only focus on one art form and like, this is your focus. This is, you know, what you're going to train in. And I think that's a little bit misleading. You know, I think it's good to be focused on something, but to know that you can start as an actor and then have a shift mm -hmm it not only makes you more well-rounded, but I think it just like makes you more insightful and like opens different doors as far as who you are as an artist. I began as a pianist and flutist and then transitioned into oil painting. And then I was like, wait a second, I wanna be in the moving picture um, industry. So it just kind of went on. Yeah. Here, here we are. <laughs> You draw from all of those different things like the music and that's huge for timing and editing you know like mm -hmm. that, you've done that that obviously influences the way you the way you think so that's that's really cool too it's amazing to hear that people aren't just you know one thing and that's I guess a really important thing for anybody who's listening to understand and it's also not too late to go back if you've gone down one track there's always another way to, to turn around do you know what I mean so 
Yeah, our first episode with Kat Castro, I mean, she began as a DP when she was 26 and like she was doing architecture before that. Yeah. So, so you never know. Wow. You just got to follow your dreams. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Can you kind of map out what, what a typical day for you would be like? The general things that you might end up doing in your day would be obviously research is a massive part of what we do and uh, uh, pulling all sorts of imagery to help me kind of flesh out these characters, script breakdowns, really important um, so that you know the sort of logistics of everything. Is it inside? Is it outside? Is this the second day? Is it the third day? You know, those kinds of things that really inform how you're trying to um, show your character visually. You would have creative conversations constantly <laughs> there's always some sort of creative meeting whether it's director or production the logistics of everything is a massive <laughs> massive part of the day fittings huge getting the actual actor in the room having the conversation with them about how they see the the character fleshing out and then you know trying all the different options that you have coming to that conclusion Definitely got to have a coffee break in there, though, somewhere. <laughs> really important. <laughs> Emily, what was your first gig, either in, you know, in theatre or in, as a costume designer? Well, well, my first, there's lots of first gigs, to be honest. <laughs> my first gig in film was actually on a, a movie called Dracula Untold, which we shot in Belfast. I wasn't the designer. The designer was um, the lady who actually designed the Lord of the Rings, um, who was really wonderful to work with. Um, I was a set costumer for that. You know, one of the biggest things that I learned that day was how important the monitors are, because it hadn't occurred to me that that would change anything. Because <laughs> I was used to theatre and you sit in the audience and you watch it and that's how, you know, and you say, oh, this isn't looking right, that isn't looking right, et cetera, et cetera. But, in film, it looks wildly different sometimes on the monitor than it does in reality. So I would stand and watch the action and, oh yeah, it looks good, looks good. And somebody once leaned over and said, uh, you know, you should be watching the monitors, right? And I went, oh, right, that's what you're all doing. <laughs> Oops. And then you do see that, oh, you, you know, I was worrying about this thing that you don't even see, or there was something I really should have been worrying about that I hadn't thought was seen. So. You know, that was a fun first experience. I just want to say, I love that you mentioned like a specific thing that you learned on your first day, mm -hmm. because I think it's so important to know that, you know, going into your first job, it's okay not to know stuff because Absolutely. that's how we learn. Um, mm -hmm. So that's like such a valuable story. Was there anything else that, like that first day that you can remember that you were like, oh. Yeah, yeah. This one's a little bit embarrassing though, because I... <laughs> I uh, was interacting with the main character. It was a fa it's fantasy uh, and half of his costume wasn't finished. This was another thing I learned actually that was really interesting because in theater, obviously we need everything to be finished weeks before. And he had a jacket over the top of his uh, doublet. And in one scene, he was in his jacket. And in the next scene, he was gonna take his jacket off but his doublet didn't have any arms on it because <laughs> they hadn't got around to it yet. So uh, really quickly, we had to whisk it off him and run it back to the shop where they were going to stitch the arms on and then run it back and then they were going to shoot the scene. And I was responsible for, for this. And as he was removing his jacket, it was quite hot. And I just sort of said, oh, it's so hot. And he went, you're right, it's really hot. Oh my God, I'm so hot, I'm wearing leather. Oh my God, it's so hot. And it just started into a spiral and we needed to get a fan. And the designer was very kind to me, but she did say, don't ever mention that again to it. You know, don't, you know, it's not hot, it's not cold. Um, you know, everything's great because it's not our job to get involved in, uh, and get in their heads as it were. And then it put that in his head that he was really hot and overheated and I had caused that problem. <laughs> so I learned to not say any of that <laughs> very quickly. Oh my. What is the best part about your job? What do you love about your job? Watching the characters kind of come to life. So getting the script, visualizing that, 
putting it down on paper and, and kind of seeing my renderings standing back and going yes I know these people now I can see who they are and then getting the actor in the room continuing that conversation with them going oh yeah I've missed that about them you've picked up on this thing let's highlight that or whatever and then seeing them on the final product and kind of stepping back and kind of knowing you've created this you've helped create this thing you know it's um magical to watch that process happen and very satisfying I think from the opposite end what's what's the hardest part of your job mm, this is not many hard things uh budget I'd say is where I struggle because everything that you've dreamed up and everything you've kind of been thinking about has to kind of shrink and you have to make it work within it and that you know it's a challenge in itself I do actually enjoy that challenge I mean that's what filmmaking is all about is problem solving ultimately a hundred percent and that is actually one of the things I'm attracted to about it is the problem solving so whilst I don't like it I do like to have to use the other side of my brain as well and troubleshoot that and actually do you know what sometimes it creates something you didn't even think it was going to create and it's better than what you thought. So you've worked on such a range of like small projects and, you know, from small projects to larger projects, like very quickly, like, can you give a, pull, a couple uh, bullet points on like pros and cons of each? The budget on a, on a smaller production uh, is, is obviously tight, but it usually you're, doing it with people that you're more friendly with or you can have a bit more of a chat with and sort of ideas kind of spiral out of that in a different way more often than not they are a little bit more artistic as well so that helps you be a little bit more like a lot of my um short films that I've done are collaborated with sort of more art feel to it so that's very interesting so on a larger budget the pro is also the help that you get. I would say that's a massive part of what we do. There's a lot of movement though, within my specific industry, talking about getting more help on smaller projects too, because it is hard to be everything all at once. I mean, at the beginning of this chat, you know, I ran through all the people within our department and uh, it is really hard to do it without any one of those, <laughs> you know, because then you have to become that role and um that's a lot on your head and you forget uh things and you need you need somebody there to help you and catch you i mean that's that's the difference between like indie films and you know yeah. the, the, the larger budget i think i feel like there's a give and take for sure so i think the next question is one of the most important questions i think we talk about <laughs> Um, it's the money question. And I think sometimes people feel like if you talk about money, you're being difficult or you're asking for something that, you know, you don't deserve or what have you, there is a stigma. So that being said, I want everyone interested in entering this business to make sure they're really comfortable talking about money. What can a costume designer expect to earn obviously there are lots of nuances so I'm going to let you kind of talk to this well yes there's a massive range I mean unfortunately you could earn absolutely nothing or you could earn like 300,000 for a movie very easily right so that's such a massive difference um unfortunately we still definitely have a culture in our industry of working kind of for free, which is tough because, and I'm talking on smaller budget here, because it is, they don't have a lot of money either. So it's really hard to then ask. So, and then, and that's sort of how you start your career. You kind of start like that because it gives you that experience. It gives you that portfolio thing, you know, to show. Um, but I will say uh, initially there isn't a whole lot <laughs> you have to kind of um be a, be prepared for that I think and then oh I'm just gonna I'm just gonna piggyback off of this because yeah. I think it's a really important thing to talk about so like how do you navigate that so we've talked about the range of you know working for nothing but you're building you know pieces for your clips or for your portfolio where you may have a little bit more to do 
but you may earn a little bit less. Like, do you balance that with like taking larger jobs with smaller, like, how do you balance that? Exactly that, exactly that. When I take a job, I try and think about the three criteria. Obviously money is a, is a point. Does it earn, how much will I earn? Will it allow me to live? Um, will I uh, get any contacts from this particular project? Will it fuel my career moving forwards? Um, am I interested in it creatively? So for me, if it doesn't hit two of those three points, I won't take the job. So it might be fantastic creatively and I might meet loads of people, but I might be paid nothing for it. But for me, that's worth it. So, cause I've got something out of it that isn't just monetary as it were, but it has the potential to give me that later on, right? So you have to weigh that. That's difficult because it, you know, you need to pay rent and you need to live and you need to eat. <laughs> And, you know, that seems to be a sort of privileged position to be in. Um, so that makes it hard to start with, for sure. But I definitely didn't have a privileged position to, to start with. So I definitely have taken some jobs that are just like, oh, OK, get this one. I just need the money and the paycheck so that then I can do the next job that isn't that way. One of the ways I managed to sort of navigate my career was um, also being in the wardrobe department. Uh, for film and television so um, they're in New York they are two different unions 764 is wardrobe 829 is uh, costume design so I also took wardrobe jobs and um, you get paid fairly well for them so uh, I have to think about what my current rate is I think it's 51 something an hour for wardrobe on the show that I'm doing wardrobe on currently is Bull uh, CBS production that would be my advice is to kind of stay within your world. That's how I've survived. Anyway. Thank you so much. I think that's so helpful because everybody, you know, you put a goal out there and I think it's so important to put a goal. Like I, I want to be a director. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, well, how are you going to get there? Number one, but how are you going to survive until you get there is, you know, kind of another question. And I think people in the arts struggle with that. You know, figuring that out was really tough. And I would have loved somebody to have just come and told me that from the beginning. <laughs> but, you know, that's the beauty of passing this down. And that would be completely my advice is, you know, yes, you want to be that director, you want to be the costume designer, whatever it is that you want to be. But there are roles that support that role that pay very well. So you can, you know, uh, have a life and also on top of that, learn and understand what it really means to be in those positions you have to get all that training at the beginning and if you treat it like training too then it'll feel better ultimately yeah. and the more you do it as a freelancer i know you know the longer you do it for the easier it'll get choosing those projects and knowing how to choose and why so yeah it, it's tough it is tough because a lot of projects are passion projects and you feel like you want to you want to help you want to be a part of it you want to be a part of that family and see what it can become um but sometimes it's just monetarily it's just not going to help you yeah that's really tough isn't it it's hard to make those calls i do try to to take everything like that though same yeah because it it does it feel it feel, feeds that other part of my soul that i need <laughs> So next question, what do you think needs to change in the industry? Um, working conditions and hours. And um, we're sort of expected to go and go and go and go and go. And your minimal day is a 12 hour day. And that's really hard. So many people don't have lives because of it. They don't have partners. They certainly haven't had children. Like it puts people off doing that because they think, well, how can I have both? It is, it is just thought of in some ways like um, we are just sort of the laborers of the project. And that is so far from the truth. And it's so disappointing to hear that that's how some people feel and think because it is a team, a hundred percent. You can't do one thing without the other. But if you didn't have the costume designer, which people do often, then you're going to have flat characters, in my opinion. You're not going to have that three dimension that you really want. You're not going to have that feeling of the film that you really want. And I think there's a massive difference between the way the actors are treated and the crew is treated. I was on a big blockbuster two years ago now in New York, and we had such torrential rain. And so obviously, you know, they hustled the actors into somewhere nice, dry and clean. And the rest of us 
all just stand out in the rain. You know, you're just getting wet and cold and then you're working for 12 hours or more. That was more than 12 hours. And that's just not fair either. The, the culture there shouldn't, it shouldn't, I understand the actors need protecting and that 100% that's part of my job, but I shouldn't be looking at my, my crew in the rain freezing and cold that's not fair either so it's such an interesting concept to me because I know that this has been a problem um, for a long time and it's a culture that seems to be really misaligned with what other industries are you know like in the business world if you left your entire team in the rain that would be a problem <laughs> It would have liked, but also the thing is, you know, nobody knows that when the, the, they just see the finished film and it looks fantastic. And you don't know that 50 people were stood out in the rain to make that work. And there was no health and safety there at all. Do you know what I mean? Like it really shocking, but nobody knows that. And that's a tough thing for people to see because the, the finished product is so wonderful. You know, they don't want to think about the people that put themselves in a difficult position to make that actually happen. Yeah. It's the same with our PAs too. There's a lot of abuse for the lower down in some ways. And that's a culture that I personally am trying to change every day. And that's why, you know, as the head of my department, as the costume designer, I would never, ever want any of my team to feel that way. It's such a, I think it's just the beginning of a very large conversation uh, in the industry. And yeah. I think that the people who are going to change it are our listeners, you know, I hope that it changes before, <laughs> but I think that the younger generations and our generation and younger are going to be saying like, this is not okay anymore. People need to have lives outside of their work and yeah. it's okay to have that. Yeah. Um, Definitely. I mean, as a woman, uh, I just had a baby Um, she's a year old and going back to work was a real challenge for me. And you know, um, I actually lost a position because of that. And this sort of this sort of stigma, even in our industry, oh, you had a baby, uh, you know, and that shouldn't be the case. I should go off and have a baby and that should be fine, uh, you know, and then come back because what I do at work is separate from what I do at home. So I'm valuable at work the same as I was before, just because I had a baby doesn't change me in any way. Um, but but I think people fear that you suddenly won't put as much into it because you want to go home and blah, blah, blah. And that's not the case. And then you sort of have to work extra hard to prove that that's not the case. And, you know, then you do end up staying later and you don't see your kid. And it's, you know, it's difficult. I'm sort of navigating that right now. And I don't want anybody to ever think that they can't have both because they can. Yeah. So I hope things do start to make that shift. That's a really beautiful point to uh, leave leave off on. Just one more question for you. What is your favorite movie of all time? Is there like a specific movie that had costume design in there that you were just like, oh my God? That's a good question. I'm the worst at favorites. <laughs> I don't have a favorite meal. I don't have like, you I'm, know, <laughs> I'm really awful at this. Um, I would say one of my most favorite movies that I just go back to time and time again, and it really has nothing to do with the costume specifically is... Back to the Future, <laughs> and I don't know why. It sort of was so, uh, captivated my imagination about things. And it, it, it's that old school Hollywood storytelling that, you know, really takes you to another place. But uh, I grew up watching quite a lot of period movies in the UK. So I always loved anything period and I want to get my hands on more of that moving forwards within my own career and my mom's very cute she calls me all the time when she watches something and talks about the costumes for hours on it it's very sweet <laughs> any advice for our listeners who want to explore the world of costume design lots of advice uh, I would say get as many life experiences as you can see as many different places experience as many different places and then in terms of getting involved start reaching out to anybody that you know and express your interest in the area that you're interested in and could they help put you in that direction it's really important to communicate with people people are more willing to help you than you think don't be afraid to ask for help find your path your road and um, go from there I mean uh, if you've 
feel that you want to learn a bit more sort of classically, then I do recommend going into a further education. It helped me grow and train in a safe environment. So, you know, I, if people are interested, then, then they want to, then I personally like doing that. And there are a number of great universities out there. Obviously I will say Carnegie Mellon was fantastic because that is where I went, but there are others out there and you should find the one that suits you best. Just start talking to people and um, immerse yourself in the world as best you can. That's wonderful. Well, Emily, thank you so much for joining us and sharing all of your knowledge and your experiences. And um, we're so grateful. Our listeners are grateful. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. I'm honored that you think that I'm worth talking to. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And I really hope that um, anybody who is listening, um, this has helped in any way. And um, yeah, good luck with everything in the future. Thanks, Em. This has been 101. It's a beginning.